Amen. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, first, uh, first chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be taking on a study of one of the most topic-rich books in all of the Word of God. You would be hard-pressed to find another book in the Bible that deals with the variety and volume of topics, as does 1 Corinthians. And um, there are a number of reasons why we uh, want to study 1 Corinthians, not the least of which, of course, is just the sheer number of topics that are covered. I think a lot of the questions that you might have concerning Christianity and the things of God, I think a lot of those questions are going to be answered in this study. You should walk out of here, yes, knowing Christ better than you do today, but you, but you are also going to walk out of here with a much shorter list of questions and struggles concerning the things of God uh, when we're through. Secondly, there is absolutely no question that the difficulties within the church and, and within the community of Christianity find their most vivid expression uh, in Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians in all of the New Testament. We're going to discover very quickly that this was a very young church and a very immature church spiritually, all right? And there's also no question that we know more about the church in Corinth than we do any other New Testament church. And so maybe to some degree that's why they look so bad, right? I mean, it's just the nature of things that the more you get to know someone, the more flaws that you're going to see and uncover. But again, the second reason why we would do well to study this book is the reason that the Corinthian church had so many problems. And the reason that they had so many problems is because this church, this church at Corinth, did not have an impact upon the culture but rather it was the culture that had an impact upon this church. All right? And friends, that's exactly what we discover in the American church today. We are not a church in this country that has a grip on our culture nearly to the degree that our culture has secured its grip upon us. And so I think this is an incredibly relevant uh, study for the time that we find ourselves living in. Now... Because the, uh, the culture, because the culture has the church at Corinth, there were some very deep, deep problems in this church. They struggled with divisions. They struggled with immaturity, instability, jealousy and envy, lawsuits, sexual immorality. Sound familiar? Know any cultures like that? Right? And from a purely spiritual perspective, this church at Corinth, above all others, really butchered and misused the spiritual gifts. And again, we've got a real problem with that in the American church today as well. So, uh, again, very relevant study for the time we're living in. And the Word of God is, is going to do a number of things for us, one of which is to help us navigate the sometimes very weird and goofy waters that the church likes to swim around in. Now, this is also a book of, of tremendous balance and great perspective. In the midst of all of this, what do we find? 1 Corinthians 13, perhaps the, the greatest exposition on love in, in all of literature, let alone the word of God, right? And then, of course, in, in the 15th chapter, we've got one of the greatest chapters in the Bible on the resurrection, Okay? So just a super rich, rich book. Very profound, yet very practical. It's going to be a tremendous journey for us. And again, my prayer is that we walk out of here, we walk out of each study knowing better and drawing closer to the person and works of Jesus Christ week by week. Okay, that's the goal. We study the word primarily in order to know him, right? All right. Now, let's do a little bit of background work. Okay, with this first study, we'll tip, typically uh, look at the culture, look at the background in order that we might make sense of the scene that's in front of us, in order that we can get our arms around uh, what's going on here in Corinth. Uh, the city of Corinth, Chad, you can put that map up there for a minute, uh, was set on a four-mile stretch of land in uh, southern central Greece. It fell between the, the Adriatic and the Ionian Seas and then the Aegean Sea. Uh, to the east, and it was situated uh, um, very, very uh, geographically distinctly. It, it was a two-port city. 
it had two ports. It had a port through the Ionian Channel, and then it had another port on the other side of it in the Aegean. So it would make it very, very uh, interesting uh, in the sense that it became a multicultural uh, city because of that. Now, cargo companies, what they would do is they would, they would take their ships, their smaller ships, and rather than sail all the way around the southern end of Greece, there were very treacherous waters there. So rather than do that, they would go through the, it was safer and more cost effective to go through this Ionian channel, put in at the port on, on western Corinth, and then they would put these ships on rollers and carts and drag them four miles across the stretch of land and then put them in at the Aegean. And, of course, they went the other way as well. So because of this unique uh, um, particular geographical location, it was a multinational, multicultural type of city. Imagine a city now somewhere between a, a half and three-quarters of a million people, and it was really um, like New York and and San Francisco, and Hollywood, and, and Las Vegas all rolled into one, all right? You're talking about a city where you could find any vice that you were looking for. Now, think of the weirdest thing that a human being could be involved in, into, you could find it there in the city of Corinth, okay? It was a drunken sailor's dream port. It was a pedophile's playground. It was a partier's Paradise. Listen, it was so bad that even the pagan world thought of the Corinthians as being a bit over the top. Now, when the pagans think you're a bit over the top, man, you've got some issues, right? And that pretty much summed up the city of Corinth. Now, spiritually, very polytheistic culture, as you might suspect, they worshipped a variety of gods. Most notably uh, is the, uh, uh, the love goddess, Aphrodite. She was known uh, by her Roman name, Venus. And, and the worship of Aphrodite involved uh, various sexual acts. Every night they had what they called, from the temple of Aphrodite, priestesses. You and I would call them prostitutes, okay? But every night, at least a thousand of these prostitutes would leave the temple of Aphrodite and sell themselves on the streets of Corinth. They financed the temple through this priestess prostitution, all right? There was a Greek proverb that said, not every man could afford a trip to Corinth. So, bizarre place. Now, they had another god, a god of healing called Asclepius. I think he was tired half the time, I don't know. Um... And they had uh, also um, Awakius, that, that was the god of caffeine, just kidding. Um, but but there, were, there were 12 different temples during the time of Paul. One of the other popular gods there went by the name of Apollo, not Creed, okay? And Apollo was a god that unfortunately was very fond of young boys. There was, there was child prostitution going on right out in the open in the streets of the city. So all kinds of bizarre, perverted, weird behavior was going on in the streets of Corinth. And so it's interesting for Bible students to remember that when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he was writing it from Corinth. All right, so as you're reading those first three chapters in Romans where Paul's just hammering away at the depravity of men, in fact, Romans uh, chapter 3 is, is often referred to by theologians as the doctrine of depravity, but, but as Paul's just hammering away at the depravity of man in those first three chapters of Romans, picture him just sitting on his front porch there in Corinth, just sort of watching all this weirdness that's going on all around him. So just, just a bizarre, bizarre, perverted environment. Now, if you go through our cities today, you'll find statues and monuments of, of war heroes, right? And, and poets and frontiersmen and, and these kinds of things. In Corinth, their city monuments, their statues depicted human sexuality and various positions and, and experiences and so forth. Can you imagine raising kids in that? Right? I mean, can you imagine taking little Johnny down to the city park? What's that, Daddy? Well, you know, not now. All right? I mean, just all kinds of weirdness is going on out there. Now, in the midst of all this bizarre behavior, we have the fledgling church of Corinth. And again, some deep, deep problems in this church. And, and yet, 
I think in fairness to this church, I don't think we have any city in our part of the world that, that could come even close to the kind of depravity that this church was forced to reckon with, right? I mean, maybe if you go to Amsterdam and even then, as far as depravity goes, those guys got nothing on ancient Corinth, all right? And so this is what Paul is dealing with. This is the scene, all right? He's going to begin chapter 1 with some introductory statements. And the fascinating thing, guys, the fascinating thing uh, um, when we get into this book is that with all of their problems, we're going to find shocking things about these people. But with all of their problems, never once do we find Paul threatening them with the removal of their salvation. Okay? We need to get that, all right? We need to see that. These people had more problems than you could haul with a large dump truck, right? And yet the Lord never threatened them with the taking of their salvation. Paul always speaks of them as brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is a letter then, guys, that really emphasizes the great grace of Jesus Christ. All right? Okay, so let's dig in then. And uh, kick off our study of 1 Corinthians. We're going to begin in verse 1. Uh, verse 1, chapter 1. Paul called an apostle, underline the word called, called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. You want to underline that guy's name? You might not know him. So Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Well, it was Paul, of course, who established the Corinthian church during his second missionary journey. And, and guys, listen, remember, Paul is a nut. All right, we're going to continue to look at the culture he's dealing with here. Paul was a crazy man, okay? Paul was the guy they beat and stoned and dragged him out of the city for dead. He wakes up, dusts off his feet, and goes right back into the city that just tried to kill him. I mean, this guy, he's got guts, right? The guy was a madman. For the Lord. And yet Corinth is the only place where the Bible records that Paul was afraid. Okay? Now I would suggest to you if there was a place that Paul was afraid of, very scary place, right? And Paul was afraid in Corinth, Acts 18 9. Okay? So Paul's afraid. The Lord, of course, he revealed himself to Paul and he said, Look, don't be afraid, Paul. I'm going to have my hand upon you. I have many people here. You just stick it out. That's in Acts 18. Paul was going to run. Paul was going to bolt because of the, the harshness and the depravity of the city. But the Lord said, look, don't be running, bro. You stick it out here. I'm going to do a great work. Point is, Paul was called by the Lord. And because he was called, there was a lot of garbage in life he could put up with. All right? Notice it says there, Paul was called to be an apostle by what? By the will of God. When you are called of God, you can put up a lot with a lot of garbage. Here's the question. Can you say, can I say that I am what I am, that, that you're doing what you're doing because of the will of God? Because you are called. Can you say that? That you are who you are and you're doing what you're doing because of the will of God, because you are called. And if you can say that, if you can say that, I have no need to add that you are a joyful, well-adjusted Christian. Now, you'll have your, your uh, rough times and some tough sledding from time to time, no doubt, but underneath it all, there is a tremendous and deep satisfaction in life because you know you're doing what you're doing by the will of God. All right? It's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Now, as was Paul's custom, he would always, in visiting a, a city, he would always go to the Jews first and present the gospel there before he went to the Gentiles. You can read about this as well in Acts 18. When Paul went into the synagogue at Corinth, the leader of the synagogue, a man by the name of Crispus, not Cream, had accepted Christ as the Messiah, born again, and there were a number of Jews that came to the faith. Well, the rest of the Jewish leaders got torqued off about that, so they took Paul to court before a Roman regional judge by the name of Gallio, and what they were trying to get this Gallio guy to do was to make it illegal to spread Christianity. 
So after Krispy Kreme left the synagogue, the Jews replaced him with a man by the name of Sosthenes. Okay? And the Jews had this Sosthenes guy argue the case before uh, the Roman judge. Okay? Gallio, the Roman judge, he hears this as a religious case. He says, get away from me. I'm not here to discuss theological issues. And he chases the Jews out of his courtroom. Well, the Jews were so upset with this Sosthenes guy for not adequately arguing their case that they beat the guy up. I mean, the Jews beat up their lead attorney. Okay? And so Sosthenes thought, man, who needs this deal? I'm out of here. And we believe he was shortly converted after that. Of course, here in verse 1, we find him working side by side along uh, uh, Paul. He was Paul's scribe. Paul had a number of health conditions. We believe he had poor eyesight. So Sosthenes was dictating this letter to the Corinthians. What's the point? Why am I telling you that? A former prosecutor and persecutor of Christianity is now walking right alongside Paul, deeply involved in the spread of the gospel. And some of you remember Paul himself was what? A former persecutor of Christianity, now deeply involved in the spread of the gospel. Listen, same is true today, guys. All right? People that seem to be the most opposed to the gospel. You know when you're out there, Sharon? People that seem to be most opposed are oftentimes those who are coming under the conviction of the Spirit. All right? Listen, when I share the gospel, I do not want to hear, well, you know, I'm glad that works for you. I don't want to hear that. I would much rather deal with an aggressive response or, or somebody that's a little torqued off by it because then I know I am dealing with a real candidate that could be coming under the conviction of the Spirit. Are you with me? This is how it happened with Paul. It's how it happened with Sosthenes. It's how it happened with me and, and countless others that I know that, I, that I've walked with over the years. So don't get pushed away by the fact that you have an adverse response to sharing the gospel. Understand that that's how it often works and that's a strong indicator that they're, they're coming under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So, so take heart there. All right. Now, let's back up a little bit as to what predicated the writing of this letter. Paul is hanging out in Ephesus. Okay, he's there ministering to the church that he started in Ephesus. And there are a group of people who travel about 350 miles from Corinth to Ephesus to rat out the church. And they come to Paul and they say, hey, hey, this guy is doing this, and this home group's over here doing that, and this guy's into this. And so this group of narcs make their way to Ephesus, and Paul now writes 1 Corinthians in response to that report he had received. So he begins now saying, hey, I'm an apostle, and I am one of authority called by the will of God. Well, notice he proceeds to address them now here in verse 2. Uh, verse 2, to the church of God. Notice it doesn't say church of Corinth. To the church of God, which happens to be at Corinth, okay? To those who have been sanctified, underline that word, sanctified. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord in ours. Well, again, notice it's not, first of all, the church of Corinth, right? It's the church of God that happens to be located in Corinth. If Paul were addressing us, he might say, hey, uh, to the church of God in three rivers, right? He's simply stating that in every place, God has those who are authentically his. Now, if you're in a group that says, well, we're the only ones that are saved, and it's us four and no more. You're in a cult, all right? If you're in a group that says, well, well, somehow your baptism isn't valid. You've got to be baptized by us. You're in a cult, all right? If you're in a group where, where you can't buy a house or buy a car or change a job or, or do anything significant without going in and checking in with your spiritual head and getting his okay, look, man, you're in a cult. All right, here's what Paul's saying, friends, that we are not the possession of men. We are not the possession of a denomination. We belong 
to God. We are God's chosen possession. He has sanctified us. I had you underline that word sanctified. That word in the Greek means to mark out for oneself. It means to set apart. God is looking over the landscape of humanity and he saw you. And he marked you out for himself and you're his possession and you're answerable to him alone. Okay, why am I telling you this? Guys, we are not to allow men to throw these weird trips on us, all right? Don't let these men throw weird trips on you that that somehow you need their spiritual authority to, to micromanage your every move. A number of years ago, there was a popular book out uh, called Undercover by John Bevere. I'm, I'm afraid to acknowledge he's a fellow Purdue grad, but um, very popular book called Undercover, uh, just being eaten up by charismatic churches. And the result was a great deal of spiritual abuse, all right? People were taught that to question your pastor's teaching was to be in rebellion to God's authority. And so rather than encouraging people, remember Acts 17? Uh, the Bereans were, Paul, Paul said there is a higher class of believers that are searching the scriptures daily to see if what they are being taught is right. The Bereans, okay? Acts 17, 11. So rather than encouraging people to be good Bereans and testing everything by the word of God, people were being told in this book that they were in league with Satan and in rebellion and all this nonsense if, if they questioned their, their pastor's teaching. All right? I, I personally believe that this book was so popular because it appealed to the fleshly nature of leadership. It was a, a real leadership ego stroker. All right? And so church leaders were just eating this stuff up and putting it out there. Look, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. All right? Jesus Christ is the spiritual authority in your life, and you should be drawing near to him. You should be drawing insight from his word and those who seek to remain faithful to it, okay? I told our church yesterday, guys, don't listen to a, and I've told you guys this too. I said, guys, don't listen to a word I'm telling you up here. Don't listen to a word I'm telling you, but you go and search the scriptures to see what you're being taught is right, okay? Paul elevates them. Uh, actually, Dr. Luke elevates them in the book of Acts as being a higher class of believers than other believers because they're searching the word to see if they're testing all things, to see if what they're being taught is right, okay? Now, he calls these guys, and again, this, this sort of goes right to the heart of the issue here. He calls them what? Saints. You might have holy people in your weaker translations, but um, notice... Uh, it says uh, in most of your translations, called to be saints, okay? That, uh, some of your translations have that to be in italics, and that means it's not in the original manuscript. So the idea here in the original language is sainthood is not something you work at. It's not something you earn. They're not called to be saints. They are called saints. The to be is not there, okay? They're called saints because they're in Christ. Listen, we don't work to be saints. It, it, it's not an, an honor given to a holy few. The literal translation in the word of God here is called saints. Guys in Corinth, you are saints. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has really messed this term up for a lot of us, right? They say, well, uh, you know, to be a saint, you, you, you got to be dead, number one. All right, you got to be dead. And then number two, you got to have a... The number of miracles associated with your name. That is flat out not what the Bible teaches. Okay? Notice here, Paul is addressing the entire church. Every single person that was in the church at Corinth, he is calling a saint. And they weren't dead. All right? They were living human beings. And given what we know about Corinth, I would suggest to you if these guys are saints, believe you me, each and every one of us in here today are saints. All right? Uh, we got nothing on them. Now, the reason why they are saints was not because they were super spiritual, but the reason why they are saints is because God has marked them out. They belong to God, and through his work and his grace, they are his saints. Not through their own work, that is God's work in Christ. If you have been marked out, out, if you have experienced the work of God in your life, then you too are a saint of God, according to the New Testament. 
And if you have not experienced the work of God in your life yet, well then get ready, man. You stick it out, you stay here. The reason you're sitting here tonight is because God has sovereignly orchestrated you being here because he's pursuing you and he wants to get a hold of your heart, all right? And he's gonna do great things in you. And it is all, again, by the grace of God. Notice verse three, grace of God. Grace to you, verse three, Grace to you and peace from God our, uh, God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those of you that have been with us, you know this is sort of Paul's standard greeting in his epistles, right? We saw it back in chapter 1 of Ephesians in our last study. Grace, by the way, the typical Gentile greeting. Peace or shalom was a typical Hebrew greeting, all right? So he's greeting both the, the uh, uh, Jews as well as, uh, as well as the Gentiles here. But what I want you to remember, again, is it's always in this order. Tune in. It's always grace first, then peace. All right? It's never peace before grace. Paul never says, well, the peace of God and the grace of God unto you. But it's always grace first and then peace. And this order is intentional in the word of God. All right? Because if you want the peace of God... you must first experience the grace of God, you see. Before there can be any kind of rest, all right, before there can be any kind of settledness in your relationship with the Lord, you have to experience his grace. That's why religious people never have rest, guys, all right? I mean, religious people, they're always trying to earn their way. They're trying to sweat and strive and, and, and the energies of the flesh to try to get to heaven. I got to earn my way to this. And they never come to that settledness, that rest in their hearts. They're always wondering, have I been good enough? The religious person is always wondering, have I been spiritual enough? I mean, is it not true that you could have read one more Bible verse this week, Garrett? Is it not true, I don't know, Ken, that, that there was one more broken heart that you could have prayed for? Right? Of course. I mean, you can always do one more good thing. And thank God that our standing before God is predicated upon what he has done and not what we do. That's the gospel. Biblical Christianity is not do, do, do. It's a bunch of doo-doo. Biblical Christianity is not do. Biblical Christianity is done. What Christ has done, he has done it all as it concerns your salvation. He said, John 19, 30, it is finished. That means you can't add anything to it. You know, when you, when you gain a concept of God's grace, when, when you come to that place where you're able to say, I'm the chief of sinners, I'm the, the chief of goobers upon this planet, and yet God loves me, and he poured out his blood for me, and I am saved. When you get your head and your heart around the grace of God, grace, then peace, order's important. When you get your head around the grace of God, the fruit of that is going to be peace. There's just that settledness and you are at rest and you know that when you have breathed your last, you're going to be cared for and safe in his presence. Amen. All right. Well, then he says, notice in verse four, we're going to look at verses four through seven. Um, and notice a pattern here. I keep seeing Jesus Christ in every single verse. Gee, what was Paul's message? All right. Uh, verse four, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in everything you were enriched, underline that word enriched there, okay? You might have sustained or kept. Uh, in, in, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all utterance and knowledge. You might have speech and knowledge in your translation. Verse 6, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now, in front of us, friends, we have a very important model that we want to take note of. Before you confront somebody about what they're doing wrong, 
you want to compliment them at what they're doing right. That's the model, right? Before you lay the hammer down, before you lower the boom, you bring them in, you draw them in with affirmation in order to gain an audience with them, all right? Hey, you're doing this well, and, you know, I appreciate what you've done over here, and, and I, I like what you're doing here, but, but there's some things we need to address over here. This is what we find Paul doing before he hammers them, and he will, he finds some things to compliment about these people. This is the, the model that the word of God lays out. You go to the book of Revelation. Their Christ, the, the ascended glorified Christ, is writing seven letters to the seven churches there in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And he always brings the butter first before he lowers the boom. All right? And there's a, there's a deliberate, de, deliberateness to that uh, in the word of God. Now, we all have people, do we not? We all have people from time to time that the Lord is going to call us to confront. I mean, Timothy told his, uh, Paul told his, his mentee, Timothy, look, correct one another gently in love, 2 Timothy 2. What did Paul just finish telling us in Ephesians, right? Speak the truth in love. So when the Lord calls us to walk through these kinds of doors, this is the way we're to approach one another. You first bring the affirmation before you lower the boom, okay? If you don't follow the model and the word of God, you're going to push people away, and you're, not, you're never going to have an audience with them, okay? You're always going to attract more bees with honey than vinegar, right? All right. Now, what I find intriguing here, this is absolutely intriguing, the first compliment that he brings to the Corinthians, intriguing. Verse 4, he says, when I think of you people... I think of the grace of God, right? I mean, you've got some troubled souls in Corinth, right? You've got prostitutes and pedophiles and they're getting drunk at communion and and all sorts of bizarre stuff going on. And so Paul decides to go with, as his first compliment, when I think of you guys, man, I'm thinking of the grace of God here, right? Now, to their credit, now these guys had a long way to go. They were bumbling all over each other, but to their credit, they did not stop at the grace of God. There are a lot of people that think, well, well, what Christianity is, is it's, it's saying the sinner's prayer and going forward and some kind of service and following the altar call, then, you know, you check that off your list and you just go on about your life. But notice that these people continued to grow. Notice he says they were enriched in verse 5, okay? It means lavished in the Greek. It has the idea of being filled with. He's saying that, well, they were kind of full of it, really, all right? That they were over the top, they were just over the top with a couple of things. What, what were they enriched in? He says, utterance and knowledge. You see that? In verse five. You might have speech and knowledge, again, in your translation. This is probably a reference to the spiritual gifts that Paul will take up in chapters 12 through 14 of this book. Because notice in verse 7 also, he says, you guys are, are, are not lacking in any gift, okay? Now, there are a few commentators that say, I, I happen to disagree with this a part of it, but there are a few commentators that will say, well, well, utterance is the gift of tongues, and, and knowledge is the gift of knowledge. And, and so Paul is saying that this is a real Pentecostal church, but also a real, real theological church. You know, you got a bunch of tongue-speaking Bible answer men here. I, I don't agree with that, I, certainly not the second part of it, because these guys didn't have any answers. They were very immature spiritually. And in fact, Paul wrote the letter in large part to answer a number of the questions and struggles that were going on there. I think what's going on here is pretty simple. I think it's what Paul said to the Colossians. Paul said, Colossians 3.16, in order to teach and admonish one another, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Same Greek word we have here for enriched, okay? Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Guys, when we're saved, and this is a church, by the way, that was really gifted with the spiritual gifts. They just abused them. We'll discover that. And that's the reason, part of the reason Paul wrote 12 through 14, the whole reason he wrote chapter 14. Um, But when when we're saved, guys, we're not just saved, but God distributes to each one of us a spiritual gift in order to build up and edify our brothers and sisters in the, in the body of Christ. 
And so Paul is going to be dealing with these guys throughout the book, and the idea is going to be, look, God has enriched you, church at Corinth, God has enriched you with a number of spiritual gifts, and you guys are growing, but you're getting all hung up on one of these gifts. This is the theme of chapter 14. And because you're all hung up on one of these gifts, you've got a number of problems that aren't going away. And I want you guys to come into the rest of what God has freely enriched you with rather getting hung up and sidetracked on this deal over here because you're trying to draw attention to yourself. And we'll get to all of that. You see, God had lavished a real spiritual gifting upon this church, but they were misusing it, they were abusing it, and Paul sought to correct that in chapter 14. But before Paul gets into all of this, and again, he brings the butter up front, right? He compliments them, albeit somewhat backhandedly, and he says, man, I'm thinking of you guys, and I'm thinking of God's grace, and I see a real power that God has distributed here. All right. Now, these guys are going to get there, okay? They're going to get there, and you and I are going to get there too. Notice the tremendous promise in verse 8. Let's look at verse 8. What a promise. Uh, Again, who there, speaking of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm, underline that, who will also confirm you to the end, okay? Blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end. What a wonderful guarantee we are here given, all right? By the way, you might have keep or sustain in your translation where we've got confirmed there. Um, but what a wonderful guarantee you can, what a wonderful warranty right here, verse eight. Listen, you can always tell what a manufacturer thinks about their product by the kind of warranty they put behind it, right? I mean, if you went to buy a car and you ask the car salesman, well, well, what kind of warranty does this car have? And he says, well, bumper to bumper, parts and labor for one hour after you drive it off the lot. An hour? I mean, you must not really believe in this car, Mr. Car Salesman Guy Car. Now, now if the guy says million miles bumper to bumper, well, well, now you've got a car you can believe in, don't you? Notice Paul is saying here, we are guaranteed to have life in Christ till the end of time. That we will one day be found blameless, he says there. Doesn't mean faultless. Every one of us in here, every one of us, every one of our lives are filled with fault. But Christ has been judged for all of those faults in order that you and I can stand before God blameless. I mean, think about that. At the end of time, we're going to stand before God and we're going to be totally and completely blameless because he took all the blame on the cross. That is staggering. Okay? Underline, again, I had you underline that word confirmed. He will confirm us to the end. Again, you might have keep or sustain there, but this word for confirm or keep or sustain in the Greek, it was a, in the Greek, it was a legal term pulled from the Greek court system that meant a transaction has been completed. Okay? Paul has the end of our salvation in view. Now, we don't see that. We don't see the end of our salvation. We see it here. We don't see the end of it, but the end of it's what Paul has in view. We talk about being saved, right? Because we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We should talk about being saved, rightly so. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, but it doesn't stop there, all right? We are continuing to be saved from the power of sin or the influence of sin. And one day in eternity, we will be saved from even the presence of sin, all right? So we've been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power or the influence of sin. And then one day we're going to be saved from even the presence of sin, okay? Throughout eternity. That is the end that Paul has here in view, okay? He is having the end of the salvation process in view. And and all of this is based upon the grace of God. The transaction has been completed, confirmed, guaranteed. Not because we're particularly spiritual. Not because we're, we're faithful or because we're doing everything right. Because we're not. 
but it is guaranteed because Christ went to the cross. That was the completion of this transaction. That's what Paul is saying, okay? And that's why this makes sense. It's nothing to do with us. And doesn't that make sense? That way, we're not all walking around one day in the new Jerusalem tooting our horn on the chariot. Hey, everybody look at me. I'm such a wonderful person, right? I mean, we are only there because of what Christ has done. So yes, yes, we have a wonderful promise. It's a wonderful guarantee, but it's because of nothing that we do. Again, it's because of what he has already done. Finally then tonight, let's close with verse 9. Um, underline these first three words. One of the themes of the book, God is faithful. Verse nine, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship. Man, double underline those three words, called into fellowship, copy them, cut them out, enlarge them, paste them on your fridge, as I like to say, called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, all right? So God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, there was a delightful and very clever book uh, many, many, many years ago written by uh, my favorite author, C.S. Lewis, uh, called The Screwtape Letters. Anybody read that book? Have you read that, seen it? Screwtape Letters. And in this book, C.S. Lewis writes of a fictional tale. It's a fictional tale of two demons corresponding back and forth by memo. One demon is the mentor, and, and one is the apprentice. And the apprentice is very clever, and, and tremendous spiritual insight into this thing. The apprentice demon, his name is Wormwood, and he has been assigned to a particular Christian in order to disrupt his life. And he wants to know how to do that. He's an apprentice. So he writes to his mentor, hey, how do I disrupt this Christian? I'm having a rough time with this guy. And his mentor writes him this letter and says, my dear Wormwood, the real trouble with your patient is that he is living as just Christian." What we want, if men become Christians at all, is to keep them in a state of mind I call Christianity and. You know, Christianity and psychology. Christianity and works. Christianity and faith feeling. Christianity and reform. If they must be Christians, he's telling his novice demon, if they must be Christians, at least let them convince them to be a Christian with an additive. Okay? Substitute for faith itself some kind of additive wormwood with a Christian color to it. Work on their horror of the same old thing. The horror of the same old thing is one of our best weapons against the humans, and that's why Christianity and, as I call it, will keep their focus off him they'll think they have to add to it, okay? And guys, that's what the enemy seeks to do, to get the believer's eyes off of Jesus Christ alone and to cause the believer to see Christ and want to add his own other deal to the equation, all right? Again, there is nothing we can add to our salvation. There is, I don't care what you do when you walk out of here tonight, there is nothing that you could do to be more saved than you are right now, Okay? It is not based upon what we do, but what Christ has done. It is predicated entirely upon his faithfulness. That's why I had you underline those words there. It's the theme of the book. God is faithful. It is based upon the faithfulness of God. Paul will tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, even when we are without faith, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13. Here, we're being told that, that look, all of the promises, all of the guarantee, all the warranty work, it's based upon the faithfulness of God. It's not based upon how faithful you've been or, or even how faithful you want to be. It's based upon his faithfulness. He never sleeps. He never disappears, all right? He never forgets. He does not change. He is the one constant in our life. He never runs out of resources, and no matter what we are facing, he is more than able and willing to deal with if we will simply give him the opportunity to do that. God remains faithful, okay? That's the key. Those are the first three words of verse 9. God is faithful. Now, look at this. Watch how this continues. You've got to get this. Stay with me. We're almost done. Look at this. God is faithful 
keep looking, by whom you were called into fellowship with Jesus Christ. Are you seeing that? Look at that with me. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship. Underline, if you haven't yet, called into fellowship. What are you called to? What are you called to? Are you called to go out and win the world? I mean, are you called to save the world? Are you called to good behavior even? Are you called to good works? Are you, are you called to make your list and check it twice and be a real good Christian? Listen, the word of God is telling you here, first and foremost, you are called into one thing. You are called to have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now, this word for fellowship in the Greek, it's the the word koinonia, and it has at least four different applications in the New Testament. Paul used it in 1 Corinthians 10 to speak of communion. He used it to speak of contribution in Romans 15. He uses it here and elsewhere to speak of intimate fellowship. This Greek word means literally partnership, okay? So we are being called into fellowship. In other words, we're being called into fellowship and partnership and communion and intimacy with Christ. In short, we're being called into relationship. Now, will a relationship with Christ produce a desire to go out and do good things? Of course it will. But get this straight, all right? The calling upon us, friends, is not upon what the relationship will produce. The calling is upon the relationship itself, all right? And think about why this is so. (laughs) Regardless of what we go out and produce, right? We're already saved. And he is faithful, 2 Timothy 2, when we are not because he can't deny himself. Are you seeing this? We're not called to what the relationship will produce. We're called first and foremost to the relationship and then to allow that relationship to then produce those other things. You can't get it the other way around because if you start doing this and doing that and doing the other thing and being at the church every time the doors are open and being super spiritual and giving all your money away and doing all this stuff without the relationship, man, you're doing religion. And you're going to fall into that trap of, of, of salvation by works. All right, so we are called first and foremost. God wants your heart. He knows later on that heart's going to produce good things, but he wants your heart first, okay? So we're called to fellowship with Christ. And over time, yes, your heart will be transformed. Yes, you will desire to go forth and do good things, but you'll be doing those good things from the right foundation because you love Christ and you want to please him because you get all that he's done for you. Now your service to him isn't religious, it's relationship, you see. That's what we're called to. And by the way, somewhere down the line, you'll discover that what he is asking you to do is in your very best interest both now and eternally. But the root of it, friends, where it all starts, what we are ultimately called to is Jesus Christ himself. That's where it starts. That's where a healthy Christian experience starts. An unhealthy religious experience starts by doing this and that and the other thing, trying to earn your way to brownie points, get to God, oh, maybe I'll be saved. Because as we said before, it's never good enough. It's all based upon what he's done. And he will transform your heart. And when you get into a a fellowship and a relationship with him, and the rest is just going to happen. Allow me to paraphrase Matthew 6.33. Seek the kingdom of God first, and all this other stuff will go down later. Okay? So we are called first and foremost to relationship. Okay? God doesn't need us. He wants us. And that's a beautiful thing. All right? Now, have you noticed that Jesus Christ is mentioned in every single verse we've covered tonight? In fact, 10 times in nine verses. What do you think the message of the Apostle Paul was? I think it's Jesus Christ. Would you look at that? Verse one, 
to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, uh, with all whom every place call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I thank God concerning in Christ Jesus. You know, uh, Verse 7, you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's over and over and over, Paul is hammering away, well, what do you think his message is? Christ and him crucified. That's what we're called to. Christ. We're not called to Christianity and. Okay? Now, friends, the study is going to take off. And, uh, tonight... We've covered some introductory stuff. We've looked at the culture. I, I think God has, has had, had, had sufficient and, and good revelation for us, for sure. But tonight, we've kind of scanned the horizon a little bit. We've looked at the background. I'm telling you, man, this thing's going to get off the ground. The study is going to take off. It is going to heat up in the weeks ahead. It is going to be fantastic. We're going to gain wisdom and insight for living. It's going to be a, a tremendous journey. But my prayer is, listen, through all this, you remember this calling right here that you remember this calling for the rest of the study, that you are called into fellowship with Christ. That's why we study the word of God. Not to climb some ivory tower of academia. Not to become some theological, pharisaical goofballs, okay? We study the word of God in order to know him, ultimately. To just fall madly in love with all that he's done and, and to come into a, just a tremendous, profound appreciation of all that Christ is. And it is that that is the driver for transformation. You just are called into fellowship with Christ. Man, the rest of it's going to go down, okay? So that's my prayer for the rest of this study. It's going to heat up. It's going to be fantastic. But let's not forget this calling here in verse 9. And now that you've blown all your New Year's resolutions, rough crowd. Now that you've blown all your New Year's resolutions, oh, <laughs> you know, let's replace that, though, with this call. Let's replace those with this call. Let us follow the call of God into fellowship with his son. Let us come to the one who has done it all. When you give yourself over to the Son, when you come to really, really know the Son, and I deeply, deeply desire that for all of you, you're going to experience His grace, and then that peace that surpasses understanding and that rest will follow, and that settledness, and, and then you will be made wise. You know, C.S. Lewis said, speaking of Christ, he said, I believe in him as I believe that the sun, S-U-N, has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Okay? Come unto the sun, make it, make it a goal for you this year, and you're going to come into, everything's going to come into focus for you, and, and everything in life will begin to make some level of sense to you as it never has before. Okay? You'll never be the same. Give yourself to the sun, Make it to this study. Don't allow the enemy to keep you away and allow this study to draw you closer to the heart of the captain of our salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for all that you are, how rich that you are. And God, we don't want to be churchy. We don't want to be religious. We want to know you. We desire an authentic and genuine relationship with you. We desire to be transformed by our awe of you, God. And so just give us that fire this year, Lord. Just, just call us to, to authentic Christianity. Call us to a genuine faith. We can't do this apart from you. And so we ask you, God, we ask you to touch our hearts with desire. We ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody said, amen. All right, good to be back.